We're excited to announce that Jim Campbell Radio has now been unveiled on YouTube. You search Jim Campbell Radio. When you get there, please subscribe. You'll get all our updates, Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell and Business Talk with Jim Campbell. All of our podcasts are right there for you. All of this new consolidated data content updated regularly. Jim Campbell Radio. Speaking truth to power, John Bolton on his tenure as National Security Advisor for President Trump. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell. John Bolton is the former National Security Advisor to President Donald Trump. He served as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations from 2005 to 2006. He held high-level positions in the administrations of Presidents Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. He's a Yale grad, their radio station, WYBC, being our first station before we went into national syndication. And his controversial new book that's just out, The Room Where It Happened, a White House memoir. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks for joining, and uh, thanks for your time. And I might say, along with all the stuff that's in the book, it's chock full of substance and information. So I think people will be fascinated uh, by the by the full book. Anyway, what I want to start off because I'm guilty of this myself. I had a when I was working on Wall Street, there was a person that was renowned for running through whoever was hired. I got the call, the opportunity. Did you, looking back, was there a little hubris there? And the second part of this question, then I'll shut up. It would seem to the casual observer that you and the president weren't exactly in alignment on foreign policy objectives uh, to begin with. I'll let you go, sir. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad to be with you. Uh, I suppose there probably was hubris, but in in the same sense, I think uh, there was ample reason to believe that uh, that the president understood what my views were and wanted me to work for him. I describe in the first chapter of the book. Uh, a number of the meetings that we had before the election, during the transition, after the election. Uh, we talked about all the key issues, Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. He had watched me on Fox News for over 10 years, and I presume listened and understood to what I was saying and uh, uh, and gave me the offer. I think the one thing we agreed that we didn't disagree on was uh, George W. Bush's decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein. But even there, we agreed that Obama had made a big mistake in 2011 in withdrawing all American forces. So uh, I, I think I think there's a kind of retrospective narrative that it was never going to work. Uh, but I think that's wrong. I, I think uh, obviously the president wouldn't have given me the offer if he didn't think it, it could work, notwithstanding his current criticisms. I mean, after all, who hired that guy, Bolton? And, and you're right. I said you read the book. There is a lot of back and forth before you ever come on. Putting politics aside, can you be successful with process failure? Yeah, well, uh, I just say about Brent Scowcroft, uh, I, I worked with him for the first time in the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, he was uh, really something, uh, really a legend and uh, spent his entire career uh, worried about American national security. So it's really a, a great loss. He, he did set the gold standard for how you do the National Security Council process, um, and uh, we all aspire to it. But, uh, but I think he would be the first to say uh, the, the, the real test here is serving the president uh, in office. George H.W. Bush was different than Richard Nixon and, and Gerald Ford when Scowcroft was there. Uh, I think the, the trouble that uh, the Trump administration has is that the president doesn't like process, uh, he doesn't care about the, the functions of the National Security Council. Uh, he doesn't understand a lot of these things. And uh, so I found it very frustrating because I think ultimately process provides protection for the president, that uh, it ensures that options are presented. It, sure, it ensures that information is brought to his attention. If, if the guy who got elected doesn't care about that, uh, it it becomes clear very quickly, and I think that undermines the uh, the whole the whole process itself. Let me ask you: that We've interviewed a guy named Dan McAdams. He's a professor at Northwestern. He's done cycle profiles of George W. Bush and President Trump. He says that President Trump and Mary Trump acknowledge this has is called the episodic man. That every day is a brand new day, as if the prior day didn't even exist, which allows him to say things from day to day that might not be consistent. Your book, you say what happened on one day had little resemblance to what happened on the next day. So is that basically true? 
Well, you know, I'm not a shrink myself. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't pretend to, to try and be able to give diagnoses. And fundamentally, I, I don't think it makes that much difference. I mean, people say Trump's a, a narcissist. Okay, well, let's say that's true. I guess Alexander the Great was a narcissist too, yeah. but he was a pretty good field general. So, so fundamentally, from my perspective, uh, it's whether you can make good policy uh, by that kind of behavior. And the answer is you cannot in national security, especially you have to be able to define your long-term goals. You have to be able to move toward them. You yep. have to be able to make changes on the fly. And, uh, it really was the case. What he said, uh, Monday afternoon was going to be different than what he said on Wednesday morning. Amazing to me. How did you balance what we call this axis of adults thing where you feel you have to rein in impulsivity and, and, and so you, it comes in the book that you kind of tried to block or slow down or hope these things wouldn't happen. How do you decide where you're, t where you're assuming policy function you shouldn't versus you are, re re you know, uh, reining in impulse? Well, uh, the, the problem with the first axis of adult was that they were so pleased with themselves yeah. that they let the press know about it and therefore the whole world. And what that did was make an already distrustful Trump, even more distrustful of his own senior advisors. Uh, I think the test is that, uh, number one, if you're not prepared to give the president your honest advice, even knowing he's going to disagree with you, even knowing that, uh, then it's time to resign, number one. And number two, understanding that the uh, as I like to put it, he was the national security decision maker. I was not. I was the national security advisor. Mm -hmm. You have to know that not all of your advice is going to be taken, and uh, and you need to know that going in. But you come to a point where if if you're just wasting everybody's time, that your advice uh, really is not uh, having an impact, then it's time to resign as well. And and that's what you do. You leave at that point. How did you deal with North, North Korea, for instance? There's, you could say Trump is thinking out of the box by trying to get in the room and talking with this guy in North Korea, or you know there's no chance he's going to give giving up nukes and we're being sort of used. How do you come down on that? Do you facilitate it? Do you try to slow walk it? Well, I, I was uh, stunned even before I got the offer for the job that uh, he had decided he was going to meet Kim Jong-un in person. Yeah. Uh, it was a mistake. The whole series of meetings were was a mistake. Uh, we gave up an enormous amount in terms of prestige and legitimacy uh, to Kim Jong-un in these meetings. We got nothing back from it. And you can see after two years of meetings, uh, there's no progress in the objective of getting uh, North Korea denuclearized. In fact, it's the opposite, that they took advantage of the negotiations to make more progress uh, both on the nuclear weapons front and the ballistic missile front. So what I tried to do was uh, make it clear that uh, Trump had to stick to his main objective, which is denuclearization, and that in the case of the Hanoi summit, the second meeting in particular, it would not be a bad thing if he simply walked away. If he couldn't get that and shut the negotiation down, that was okay. And he, he ultimately accepted that, and that's what he did, and it was the right thing to do. So I think uh, he, he knew what I felt about the negotiations. He wasn't going to get Kim Jong-un to agree to it, uh, and it was largely a waste of time. Does the president go into this meeting and say one with Putin? Is he not prepared well enough? Sometimes he looks like he sets himself up to be a dupe. I particularly noticed the meeting where he defended Putin over our 17 intel agencies on on the election. And he said he was so sincere. He said, you could come in and investigate. All I want is Bill Browder. But Bill Browder, I know Bill Browder. I've interviewed Bill Browder. Putin wants him dead. It doesn't make the president look all that impressive that he kind of was suckered by that kind of a deal. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, Putin and Xi Jinping could could play Trump like a fiddle. I think I think yeah. that's how easy it was. And and the answer to your question is, no, he was not prepared in these meetings. And what's more, he didn't think he needed to be prepared. Uh, he, uh, like all presidents, uh, don't know everything about the job. It's too complicated to assume that anybody will. But good presidents know that they have to learn what they don't know. And Trump just simply disagreed with that. He believed that, uh, as he thought he had done in his business uh, career, he could size uh, the leader of another country up across the table in just a few seconds. 
uh, and that, uh, you know, the two big guys get together, they can hash everything out, cut the deal, and he can do it on instinct and gut, and he didn't need to be I- informed in detail. You, you have, uh, potentially, you could have had a huge amount of leverage, right, if you testified back in the um, Senate impeachment trial, and we didn't know the pandemic was coming, which has been epically mismanaged. And do you regret at all that you did? And I know you feel it was democratic malpractice, et cetera. But do you feel that in retrospect, if you testified, you might have had more credibility than anybody in the nation? Well, I don't think it would have made any difference. And, and to be clear, the Senate voted not to have witnesses. I, I had said, if you if you ask me to testify, I will. And they right. said, no. Uh, and what's more, the reason that many Republicans gave, I think, is important. Uh, Lamar Alexander, who's actually retiring, so he had no political at stake, said, I believe the Democrats' uh, version of what happened in the Ukraine conversation. I do think Trump tried to condition security assistance on getting an investigation of Biden and Hillary Clinton going. Uh, and it's, it's, a ter- it's terrible conduct, but it does not rise to the level of an impeachable offense. So uh, anything I would have said, Alexander would have said, well, I, I'm sure everything Bolton said is true, but it's not impeachable. And, and by the way, you know, in the House, the Democrats never issued me a subpoena. So yeah. if I'm so important to their case, where's the subpoena? You'll see the business talk with Jim Cat. We're talking with uh, former National Security Advisor John Bolton. The thing is, you, re- you realize that the, it would have been fil- filibustered through the election, right, anyway, when you say, you know, uh, that you would have responded if they'd asked you to come. I, I don't know. It just seems that it's unfortunate that the whole story never really, uh, never well, really... Well, the whole impeachment process was a mess. A mess. That's why I yes. call it impeachment malpractice. The Democrats took a possible way of finding out what Trump had, had done, not just in Ukraine, but on a range, right. of, and drove it straight into a ditch. And I think you, I think you will, you say in your book that his policy, it's policy by obstruction of justice. <laughs> and now we're going to switch for the remainder to what I call a little tour of foreign policy tour. By the way. Ambassador Bolton was the 27th National Security Advisor, held other interesting jobs, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division, and Assistant Administrator for Program and Policy Coordination for the U.S. Agency for International Development. So let's go through these uh, quickly. China, did the, did the, has the trade war worked? And does the president really believe that when Americans are par- paying tariffs, that the Chinese are paying us tariffs and we're making money off that? Uh, I, I think he does. Uh, he, <laughs> he has a very simplistic kind of balance sheet view of things and uh, trade deficit bad, trade surplus good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this, I do think that he appreciates that China has gotten rich for close to four decades uh, by stealing American intellectual property engaged yep. in forced technology transfers and that yep. the the, the real uh, offense here uh, is the way they've gained the system. They're pursuing a mercantilist foreign policy and the, what's supposedly a free trade organization. And the use of tariffs, I think, was like uh, a two by four between the eyes to get China's attention. But I don't think uh, there's any serious prospect that negotiations are going to make things better, that China is going to give up a business model that's been very successful for him. But I will tell you this right now, as we speak, uh, Trump's rhetoric on China is tough. Uh, he's taken some harsh uh, measures, economic sanctions, closing the uh, Houston uh, consulate China had. Uh, but the day after the election, he is perfectly capable of turning on a dime and saying to Xi Jinping, let's start the negotiations again. He calls it the deal of the century. He wants the big deal. I think he'll be right back to it. What do you think about Hong Kong? Well, look, I think uh, the, 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 what China is doing is so clearly a violation of their commitment to Great Britain in the handover yeah. agreement to maintain one country, two systems, that it calls into question the seriousness of China's commitment to any international uh, agreement it makes, like a trade deal, like an arms control deal, like, you know, fill in the blank. They, they know what they're doing. The, the pictures of the Chinese Hong Kong security forces walking through the offices of the Apple Daily newspaper. What else do you have to say? Good point. So let me ask about Venezuela. That seems to be a place that Trump was actually engaged in. Did you guys fumble or do anything that the regime change did not happen? 
Well, look, uh, obviously it hasn't happened. Uh, we, we all wish it did. But I think we went into it, even though Trump may not agree with this, knowing it was a long shot. The opposition saw what could be their final opportunity with Maduro's fraudulent election. We helped build an international coalition. And I tell you, on April the 30th uh, in Caracas, they came very, very close to overthrowing Maduro. It was very close. Things went wrong. It didn't happen. The people of Venezuela are suffering for it greatly. Uh, and I think the support for overthrowing Maduro nonetheless remains incredibly strong. And I'll say this, if the Cubans and the Russians left Venezuela today, Maduro would fall by tomorrow morning. Now, you're obviously in favor of pulling out of the Iran nuke deal, but you're not in favor of regime change uh, actively uh, involving the U.S., right? What, what's the answer in Iran? No, actually, I am in favor of regime change. The, the, oh, how though? How though then? The, the, well, the failure, I think, of the administration's policy was that we never could get Trump to adopt it. Uh, how? Look, I think the American no. sanctions uh, after uh, Trump pulled out in May of 2018 have had an impact on an already devastated economy. I think the yeah. global oil prices, uh, 40 years of mismanagement, never let your economy be run by priests. Uh, and then finally, COVID-19 uh, is, is, has left the economy in tatters. I think there's overwhelming popular opposition to the regime. The yes. trouble is the regime has the guns, the people don't. But I think uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, which was entirely the right thing to do, sure. shows how you can split the top leadership of the Revolutionary Guard and the conventional armed forces. I think that regime is weaker than people think. And I think helping the popular opposition could, uh, could, could bring it down. Let me ask you a question about morality here now. Uh, I've been bothered that um, extrajudicial um, uh, assassinations, murder, if you will, doesn't seem to outrage us, whether it's Putin or MBS in Saudi Arabia having Khashoggi uh, chopped up. Uh, am I just naive? In any society, you want rule of law and you want uh, people who are accused of crimes that uh, are legitimate crimes given due process. Uh, uh, Khashoggi didn't get due process. The president said right. he found a full accounting by Saudi Arabia. That remains the U.S. Uh, position. Uh, you know, and I, I think you can say that in spades about China and Russia. What do you um, think a second term of President Trump looks like? And is it an existential threat? Would you go that far, having been on the inside? Well, I, I think uh, I think it is a threat to the republic uh, if it's two terms. I think he's done damage in one term. I think that damage can be repaired. Two terms I'm, I'm more worried about. I can't predict what a second term will look like. Uh, one of the points I try and make in the book is that so many of his decisions in the national security space were not based on the merits pro or con of a particular policy yeah. idea. Uh, so if he's reelected, with that political guardrail eliminated or, or, or diminished, certainly, uh, he doesn't need to fear the political consequences as much from his own point of view. So I think he's going to do a lot of things that uh, withdraw from NATO is a possibility, withdraw from Korea and Japan. Uh, Germany. Uh, yeah, sure. I, th I think uh, as the, what he's already done, a partial withdrawal before the election. That's how strongly he feels about it. He's withdrawn in Afghanistan below the level we thought he had agreed to. So I think this is all very dangerous long term. Uh, I want to ask you just one more question, uh, and then we'll let you go. And, and it, it, will, it will challenge you a little bit. Can, can you give one sentence strength and weakness for the four presidents you work for? Well, I think uh, Reagan's strength was uh, his clear uh, idea of, uh, of uh, winning over communism. You know, he once said, here's how it ends. We win, they lose. And he was right about that. Uh, his weakness was he didn't, uh, at the end, I think, pay as much attention to detail. That's how Iran-Contra uh, happened. Uh, Bush 41 uh, strength was the massive uh, defeat of Saddam Hussein, throwing him out of uh, Kuwait, and even more important, uh, fulfilling what happened, what started during Reagan of the defeat of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact. Uh, weakness, obviously, wasn't paying attention on the domestic front. Uh, his interest was national security, uh, and and he let the, the failed governor of a small southern state beat him in 1992 uh, to the nation's disadvantage. Uh, Bush 43, um, I think he uh, very strongly believed in 
uh, making sure that another 9-11 didn't happen to the United States. And I think a lot of steps were taken in his administration, including the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, uh, to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, his weakness, honestly, he wasn't paying attention to the economy either. And obviously, we had the great recession, and it, uh, it, it gave us Barack Obama. Uh, Donald Trump... Uh, uh, Donald Trump's strength and weakness are exactly the same thing. I think he cares about one thing, and that's getting reelected. It's been a great tour of your mind as well, sir. Great honor to have you, Ambassador John Bolton. The Room Where It Happened, a White House memoir. Great book. Thanks to John. Thanks to our national audience. We'll see everybody on the next edition of Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thank you for your time, sir. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very Appreciate much. it very much. Take care. Thank you.